Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Thursday night edition of Citizens Climate Lobby University. Uh, just a little side note, it'll actually be changing to be called Citizens Climate University pretty soon. Lots more information to come on that pretty soon and some uh, changes that we're making. Uh, tonight, we are honored to have uh, CCL Director of Operations, Amy Bennett, on the line. Uh, Amy is the, when it comes to scheduling meetings with members of Congress, there's probably no one in the country who has uh, helped more people and uh, uh, scheduled more meetings herself. So uh, if there's ever someone, uh, anyone in our organization that you want to uh, talk to about this or hear from, it's Amy. So um, we're going to get started here in just a moment. Um, there's a, a beautiful picture of Amy on the screen. But let me just tell you a couple of things for housekeeping. Um, if you, uh, when we stop for questions, all lines have been muted right now, but when we do stop for questions, you can unmute yourself by pressing star one on your phone or clicking the little microphone symbol next to your name. Um, this lesson is being recorded. So if you're having any types of audio issues, you can always, or excuse me, any video issues or audio issues, you can always listen to the lesson uh, tomorrow after we chop it up and put it into a podcast and on our YouTube channel. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Bennett. Great, thank you, Ricky. Um, well, my name's Amy. I've been with Citizens Climate Lobby since almost the beginning in 2007. I started as a volunteer, and fairly shortly after that, well, it became staff. And my background is in volunteer management uh, with actually animal-related services in nonprofits. So I think my dogs are under control and far enough away where you won't hear them bark. But that's my background is with animals and nonprofit work. Um, and what we're going to do tonight uh, is we're going to talk about how to set a meeting with a member of Congress, and then how do you also coordinate that with headquarters, CCL headquarters, uh, so that we know who's making appointments with who. And for in-district lobby days versus DC lobby days, what are the differences there? So to start out, I. We're going to tell you a little bit about some scheduling software and also then go into the actual process step by step of how to get a meeting. But I, I love this advertisement and I, I mention it a lot, but it's just so terrific. This is a, a, a little advertisement that Ernest Shackleton posted. He went to explore Antarctica and he put an ad out that totally applies to what we do at Citizens Climate Lobby. And he says, Men, uh, and that's in our case, men and women wanted for hazardous journeys, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. So when you apply that to a meeting, it's like, yes, yeah, sometimes you feel like you're not getting any, you're not hearing anything back from your member of Congress's office, and you feel like you've got complete darkness, but then you get your meeting and get to go and have a terrific meeting with your member. So. Uh, so we're looking forward to helping you get that meeting. Now, CCL has multiple coordinated lobby days throughout the year. Many of you in your groups on your own have meetings in district with your members of Congress and plan those yourselves and, and do those without coordination. You submit your meeting minutes and that's awfully helpful to us. But then we have three that are coordinated. We have our new one, which is our spring lobby drive, which is in your district. And then we have our June big international conference in Washington, D.C. And then we have a November Washington, D.C. lobby day as well. No other organization does it like CCL. When these offices find out how many meetings we have, sometimes 500 in one day on Capitol Hill, um, and last year we had 1,237 meetings in the entire year, the Congress is very, very impressed with the numbers of meetings that we have and the level of expertise that we bring to these meetings. So uh, uh, this is, um, well, we just do it like nobody else. And the um, the thing I want to tell you about, which is almost a little housekeeping thing, is, as Ricky has mentioned, um, we coordinate a little bit with you depending on which type of lobby day it is. We have a computer program that sends emails. It sounds like it comes from me, and indeed it does come from me, but it's automated. And what it helps us do is to track your progress with your member of Congress, but it also allows us, because of the volume of Congress members and the numbers of volunteers we have out there in districts making appointments, it allows us to coordinate that um, with much more efficiency. 
So I want to thank you for your patience because I'm actually on a learning curve with this software. Uh, but it does enable us to process and manage thousands of emails about which of you are making appointments where, how is it going, do you need help, how far along are you, so that ultimately for the DC lobby days, when we all get to DC, maybe eight or 900 of us are going to be going to meetings on the Hill. This program, using algorithms, allows us to create a master schedule for everyone so that everyone who comes to DC actually gets a schedule based on constituency that puts them in uh, maybe three meetings in a day. And we cover the entire Capitol Hill with our volunteers and create incredible political will. Now, for the lobby days on the Hill, we actually track all your progress. So the first thing we'll ask with these emails is, are you the appointment setter? And then we'll also ask you to use this personal link that we send you to track all of your progress. And that does allow us to create these master schedules. However, if it's an in-district lobby day, as we have coming up, then the only thing that we're going to be asking you for is just to let us know and confirm that you are the actual appointment setter. Um, that's all we need to know because for you, the rest of that is going to be, you're going to be planning the meeting with your group. You're going to be coordinating um, with your, um, your other groups near you. Um, and we don't need to, to know any more because you're going to be figuring out who's going to the meeting. We don't need to coordinate any master schedule for that. So what I want to ask you to, to remember is to use the personal link that you get. When you get that email, there's a blue link in it. And I know my hand automatically goes to my mouse on my computer, and I want to click reply or click forward. But, but what we want to do is click on the link to answer the question. You can you can say, You're, you're breaking up, Amy. I am. Can you, let me slow down a little bit. Can you hear me any better now? Yes. Let me slow it down a little bit. I can, I can be right up there with Mark Reynolds for fast talking. <laughs> Amy, anyway, we're actually having, Amy, Amy, this is Rick. I'm sorry. We're actually having a little bit of uh, degradation in your, in your phone signal. So, um, if you could just repeat that last part that you were talking about, about the personal link. Okay, great. So we'd like to have you use the personal link that comes in the email. And rather than forward it or reply to it, actually click on the blue link, which will take you into CCL Community, where you can answer the question, I am the appointment setter or I'm not, or you can suggest someone else. And if you suggest someone else, it helps if that person kind of knows that they're going to be suggested. If you know them, you know they're interested in making the appointment. Now, most of you are liaisons, but not always do liaisons make the appointment. Sometimes the liaison for a congressional district is going out of town or traveling or something where they actually delegate the appointment setting to someone else. And so that's where actually Ashley, um, and I, my name's Amy. Sometimes there's a little confusion. Ashley works with liaisons, but I work with appointment setters. So again, we ask you to click on the link rather than forward it or reply to it. Ricky, are you hearing me OK? Yep, we got you fine now. Good, good. OK. So to start off, we're going to confirm appointment setters. And this is several months in advance. And I'd like to be a myth buster here. Oftentimes, our CCLers think if they're not going to be in the meeting, if they're not attending the meeting, that they are unable to set the appointment. And that's not the case. You absolutely can be an appointment setter, even if you're going to be out of town or cannot attend the meeting. Oftentimes, it's the liaison or the designated appointment setter who actually has the strong relationship with the office. So you can still set the appointment, just other people will attend. Um, again, use the link. And a little trick if you're having trouble getting into the link is sometimes it helps to open up CCL community in another tab 
on your browser, then go in and go back to your email and click on the link. I found that for a few people, that does the trick when they're stuck. I also want to suggest that you work with other groups near you. When you're confirming that you're in a appointment center, you want to think about, is there another group that also works with that congressional district? Or if you're thinking you're going to make a Senate appointment, for instance, in California, we have Barbara Boxer's office, and our liaison and appointment center is Peter up in Northern California. And he generally is the one who makes the face-to-face -face appointment to actually meet, meet with the senator. But down here in San Diego, where I am, I might, our group might say, well, how about if we go visit the local office and deliver a whole bunch of postcards that we got signed at a tabling event? So the idea there would be to coordinate maybe with your group leader or your regional coordinator and make sure that anyone making an appointment with the boxer offices knows about it so that if, if the office says, why are there two people making the appointment, you can explain. There's going to be a face-to-face -face meeting with a Congress member in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we're going to deliver some postcards to Caridad in the San Diego office. So it helps to always coordinate. It take, does take a lot of teamwork with your fellow uh, CCL group. So you can uh, keep in mind that it does take sometimes up to seven to ten times to actually get the appointment set. Some of you, you may have no trouble, and it may be a couple of times that you contact the office and you're all set and ready to go. But be prepared for there to be those complete months of darkness. <laughs> Not really, but there is going to take some time. Um, and it may be a little back and forth. You can, we can always help you. You can reach me at appointments at citizensclimatelobby.org. And I'm always, always happy to help. Um, I can help. If you can't figure out when you got a reply to an email, what does this mean? It sounds like they're denying me a meeting. But sometimes it's not really a denial. So feel free to email me or call me. Now, to start off with, you're also going to do some basic research calling the Congressional Office, and it also allows you an opportunity to really set a friendly tone with the office. So you might call the Washington, D.C. office or the local office to find out what their preferred method is for a face-to-face -face meeting. Well, let's backtrack a little bit. What does that mean, a face-to-face -face meeting? Anybody you're going to meet with, they're going to be face-to-face -face with them, right? <laughs> but for the sake of, of uh, Congress, we refer to a face-to-face -face as actually meeting with the Congress member themselves. And that is really a very high leverage thing that we can get. We don't always, not every meeting can be face-to-face. -face. In fact, you know, you wouldn't expect that everyone is face-to-face, -face, but we generally always try to get a face-to-face -face and be prepared that you may end up being offered a staff-level meeting instead. But a face-to-face -face, uh, we refer to as with the member themselves, and generally speaking, the office, uh, the Congress member's office understands what you mean by that as well. So when you're calling to ask for the preferred method, you want to um, ask what is the preferred method and clarify the location. Sometimes for one Congress member, his scheduler in Washington may handle both the Washington, D.C. meetings and the local meetings. But for other Congress offices, they have a local scheduler at your local city office. So just clarify that. You might also want to clarify the dates that you're asking for so that you can reconfirm that the Congress member is actually going to be taking those, those uh, dates and actually going to be in the district. We've had a few members who say they're going to stay in Washington, D.C. and aren't going to be available this spring. So it's good to clarify with the district office when the member is actually available for meetings rather than setting and asking for a date where he's, he or she is not there. And you might want to ask also, is this process, for instance, if they ask you to initially send an email or fill out a web form on their website or even send a fax, is that process for requesting a face-to-face -face meeting the same if it ends up being a staff level meeting? Oftentimes, uh, you're going to be um, ending up communicating with the staffer that you're going to meet with. and. Sometimes the scheduler will handle that, and sometimes it will mean directly emailing the staff person. You also want to confirm all of the staffers 
uh, that you could potentially meet with, confirm their names and emails. You want to ask for the scheduler's email and her name, the energy aid, the environment aid, and the tax aid. Now, in the district offices, that might be slightly different. There's a district director who's a great person to meet with if he or, if he or she is available. The district director is oftentimes the person who spends the most time with a Congress member. So that person will have the Congress member's ear. But there may be another person in the district office that handles energy envi or environment issues. And generally, the energy, environment, or tax aides are generally in DC. Sometimes they can join a meeting in the local office by phone um, if that's appropriate. Now, I like to point out that some offices are very particular about that first step, using the web form, using fax, or what have you. And if you don't do that, it will oftentimes kind of get your request stuck. Uh, and so you want to be sure to follow their preferred method, even though it, it, you have a good relationship with the office. If you know that's their preference to fill out a web form first, go ahead and do that. But generally speaking, the follow-up after that is with the scheduler via email. But again, just with a friendly tone, just give them a call and ask what their preference is. And if you do get denied, you want to be prepared to ask for the correct staff person that you do want to meet with. So if you've already done this research, you'll already have the names of the people that are your preferred staffers that you would like to meet with if indeed it gets to the point where you don't get the face-to-face -face and you can request a staff meeting. So step two, a couple months beforehand. That's when you want to send in that initial request. I really like to emphasize, now these are all just suggestions, but I like to emphasize to keep the correspondence as brief as possible. Because in the correspondence, you're not, your goal there is to get the appointment. You don't need to convince them to agree with your policy. You might want to give them a, a reason for the meeting, and of course they are going to want a reason for the meeting, but your correspondence to get the meeting doesn't have to focus on convincing them of the policy. You might briefly describe it, but you don't need to convince them. That's when you get the meeting, then you have your opportunity to do that. So keeping the correspondence very brief is so helpful because staffers are so busy. Staffers read their emails on their phones. They read them at Starbucks. They read them, I don't know if they can read them in elevators or not, but they are reading them all over the place where they may not be able to take a phone call, but they can respond to an email. Um, I don't know about you, but I learned with my son once he got a cell phone that that was the, that texting was the way to actually have him reply to me. Now we don't we don't have the opportunity to text staffers unless they actually give you their cell phone numbers. But the next closest thing for them is email, because again they're oftentimes in a place where it's just too loud to reply, or they just physically can't reply uh, by voice. They're millennials; they've got this wired. Um, and keep in mind that these offices and even individual staff members can receive thousands of emails a day. They can be inundated. Barbara Boxer's office, I can't even remember the figure, but it, it just floored me, the volume of emails that these folks get. So just like when you write a letter to the editor, if you can keep your emails between 150 words or maybe a little more than that, they'll really appreciate it. They're reading it on a pretty small screen, even if they have the new iPhone that's a little bit larger, it's still a pretty small screen that they're reading it on. To open, I like to follow the CCL way of opening with an appreciation statement, something that you really can sincerely thank them for. And I think that sets the tone that you're coming in peace. Very helpful to identify that you're a constituent. Constituents have the most power to get that face-to-face -face meeting or a meeting of any kind. And then if you have a local or personal concern, something that's really specific to your region or to your area, um, that's very helpful too. If you can voice, say, I'm personally worried about you know, the lack of water in our area or, or I'm really worried about my children or my grandchildren's future, you know, that really speaks to them on a personal level. Now, meeting purpose is important. They do want to know why you're going to meet. And this is the purpose statement for the spring lobby drive. I believe Ricky's going to send out some notes, and this will be in it, so don't feel like you have to write this down. But uh, Danny and, uh, helped draft this uh, because we have some super valuable information 
from Kevin Emmel. So here's a statement that I'm inserting into my request this spring. We'd like to meet to share a report CCL recently commissioned which shows how California 49th, that's my district, will benefit from our carbon fee and dividend. The study estimates what percent of your constituents will end up ahead with CCL policy and broken down by income, quintile, and race. So you can see how different populations of concern are affected. The study is offered, authored by Kevin Ummel of the International Institute for Applied Systems. And I want to point out that all of us on the phone are you know, devoted to this, this work, and we know how important it is. But I want to point out that this information that we have is a huge resource to the office. We know, you know how serious this issue is, but this specific this specific information is a huge resource, so it's a great thing to, it's a great carrot to dangle. I always like to, to end my request with a, a request for action on their part, and I'm looking forward to their reply, and I like to make it as easy as possible to respond. Um, Mark and I email each other a lot, Mark Reynolds, and I know he gets a lot of emails and I get a lot of emails. I love to send him an email that he can just get answer yes or no to. And I love it when I get an email back from him that's just the, the letter Y. <laughs> it means I'm making his life easy. And the more you can help the staffer's life be easy, the more your request moves up the priority list um, of getting that meeting. Okay, well, you want to stop here? Yes, yeah, yeah. Why don't absolutely. we uh, let you catch your breath? Yeah, actually, let you catch your breath there for just a moment, and uh, we'll open it up for some questions here. We got one in the chat box that I'll lead off with, and then we'll um, we'll take some from the rest of the folks here. Maribel um, asks uh, Amy, could you please clarify what you mean by preferred method again? Absolutely, Maribel. Every office is different. When I first started doing this in 2007. There were a lot of districts across the country that didn't have, my guess is, they didn't have good internet connections but had good phone lines. They actually asked to have the initial request sent in by fax. And not all of us have faxes in our homes. I, I happened to have a computer that would do it, but I was actually a little surprised. Uh, so their preferred method was that fax. And if they didn't get that fax, they weren't going to move your request along. Another office may prefer um, that you start off this process by going to their website and they usually have a contact us tab and then there's an option for you to correspond with the office and then request a meeting. Sometimes they'll even have a specific form for requesting a meeting where you fill out if it's a district meeting or a meeting in DC uh, and for you to mention whether or not you're a constituent, uh, put in your zip code number with the extra four digits. So this is just how they manage their offices. Each office is different. Some of them are going to be very casual and just say, email the scheduler and here's her email. Some scheduling emails have a, uh, an interesting email name, like scheduler49 at mail.house.gov. That usually stands for something like scheduling for district49 at mail.house.gov. So ask, you might ask, is that a special email? Now, that email goes to the scheduler, and she probably has her own separate email address. But if that's their preferred method to send it to that email address, you want to be sure to take the time to get that email address exactly right, or of course it'll bounce. So every office is different. It's their preferred method, so you just have to call and ask them. Sometimes uh, that takes a couple of calls, because it might be the DC office or the local office that has that information. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Maribel. Um, so if there's anyone else along that wants to ask a question, you can press star 1 to unmute yourself at this time, or click the little microphone symbol next to your name if you're online. Uh, I have a question. This is Peter and I yes. am it's, it's unclear to me whether we should be focusing only on our representative or on all three, the representative and our two senators. Um, and what state are you in? Iowa. Iowa. Okay. That would be a good thing to bring up. I don't, I'm not sure if you have a state coordinator. Is it um, uh, Anita Christensen, I believe? You, you want to go to your regional. Name, but uh, I've contacted. You gave me some names of a state coordinator 
and a state something else. Which, and I contacted them, but they haven't contacted me back yet. So I would contact me if you don't hear back from them, because you do want to coordinate as, so that you're not having overlap. It's very important, and that sometimes can be you know can take a few emails or phone calls and say. You know, this is what I'm trying to do. Does this overlap with what you're trying to do? Your state coordinator or regional coordinator uh, would be good contact, as well as your group leader, although you might be the group leader, um, to just to make sure that you're not overlapping. My group, for instance, I believe is just working on um, Daryl Issa, our congressman. Um, but you know, it, it'll vary by state. Um, in California, we have so many CCL groups that, of course, everyone isn't going to set up a meeting with their Senate office. And it just takes contacting them. And if you can't reach them, feel free to contact me, and I'll try to track them down or get a phone number um, so that we can, we can get you in contact with them. And I'm at Amy at citizensclimate.org or the appointments email that is in the, um, in the slideshow. OK, thank you. This is Daryl Hart in Wichita. Yes, Daryl. Uh, the, uh, the tool that's going to be available from Kevin, and I forgot his, I mean, I didn't understand the last name. Uh, that report, Kevin Hummel. OK, yes. is that going to be uh, available to us for the in-district or is that going yes. to be available for the other event? Um, that's for that's coming up, and Danny Richter is going to have a training on it later this month. Um, I don't have the training date in front of me, but it is our. If you're on CCL Community, go to CCL University, and it's listed there. So it's so recent, and Danny is actually working right now on on how to present that to you, so you can present the information to your member, and that mm -hmm. is going to be going to be coming up uh, later this month, and it'll be on a Thursday night, I believe, and just check CCL Community and sign up. That'll be a very important, uh, very important training for all of you to join. Anyone else? Hi, Amy. This is Dave Craig. Can you hear me? Yes, Dave. What's your question? Hi, I'm calling from New Hope, Pennsylvania, and um, I was wondering, um, when we set these meetings, is the idea to have as many people uh, from our lobby as possible to go, or if we're not able to get enough people, can we just go ourselves, or how does that work? We always like to lobby in teams, but it's also something that's going to come up in the next few slides, where it depends on your office. Some of these offices have limited space, and they will actually uh, sometimes tell you, we only have room for four people. Um, other offices won't ask, but it might be a good idea for you to ask. It's nice to have a big group, but actually a group of four, five, or six is, is plenty. We've had many, many meetings with just two or three people, but a team is really great because if you go, if you go on as one person, that's telling them one person in the district feels this way. More than one means you're representing a group. So it's always helpful, I think, to go in with more than one. And ideally in the district, if the office has room, maybe four or five people would be wonderful. You might um, find out if they actually have meeting times available on weekends. Some of the members come home on the weekends and will allow meetings on Saturday or Sundays, which will allow some of your folks who work during the week to attend. So these are some of the questions you can ask when you call the district office about what's possible. You might also ask them, you know, I, you could say, I understand some of these offices have space limitations. Um, you know, can, What's your suggestion on how many people we should bring, uh, you know, in terms of your office space? And they might they might tell you, you know, four or five is plenty, or they might say more. If you have too many people, it's it's a little bit hard uh, hard to manage. But it is also a show of force. So we like to leave it up to you. Um, if you can manage a few more people than that, and and think you all can do your meeting roles, go for it. Great. Thanks, Amy, and thanks for the question. Um, we're, let's go ahead and um, just real quick, there's a question from Emily. Emily's question, uh, is the animal study just relevant to California? And Emily, the answer to that is uh, no, the, the animal study is going to be for every district across the U.S., so it's going to be something that we can all leverage. All right, Amy, you want to go ahead and pick up here? It's about 7.30. I just want to keep Absolutely. this on track. We'll have, we'll have time for yes. more questions uh, at the end. Thanks, everybody. You're on. Oh, go ahead and just uh, move on to that. There we go. Thank you. Um, so third step of our four-step process here is um, 
about a month before the meeting. Keep in mind that it's going to take seven to ten contacts sometimes. And remember that um, for the lobby days in DC, to go ahead and go in and save that link and log your progress. Now, for this just in district meeting, once you've told me who's making the appointment, we're good to go. And then a question comes up as to how often is too often to send another request? And I can if, if you don't get a reply in seven to ten, ten days, I would go ahead and, and send another request. You might even forward the one if it was by email. You might even save the the one that you sent before and forward that again. Um, but seven to ten days without a reply, and I would send another. Now, what happens if you've tried three times and you haven't gotten any response at all? Usually, they'll send you at least an auto email, you know, saying we got your your request and we're going to get back to you in two to three weeks. And then you know you can wait two to three weeks. But if you get nothing, it could be that spam is is the culprit. So here's what I've tried, and it really works. It gets a response right away. Um, you know, so far, I've tried three times, been polite, and, and just you know, tried to use their preferred method. What I do then is I'll call the office and you know, have the name of the person that I think should be receiving these, so it's the scheduler or the staffer's name. And I ask to leave them a message or ask if they're in the office. You'll almost always get directed to their voicemail. So I'm ready with my voicemail message to them. And I say, hi, this is Amy Bennett. I've tried several times to send you an email, in fact, three times to send you a request for a meeting. And I'm a little afraid it's going to your spam file. So Miriam, or whoever you're calling, you say, Miriam, I'm just going to let you know I'm going to send another one right now. Could you be on the lookout for it in your spam file? Now what that does is it's a short message. It gives them a heads up that you haven't heard from them. It, it easily could have gone to their spam. And what happens by then, if you send an email right after that, right after you leave the voicemail, it will be either at the top of their email box or the top of their spam box. And they can get to it at first thing. And that almost always works to get a response. So that's just a little trick. <laughs> Now, here's a question that I get. How often should I be contacting the office? Persistence pays, but what's too much? What's going to be perceived as annoying? And again, I kind of use that seven to 10 days, uh, sometimes even two weeks. If, if you're further out from, uh, if you're working pretty far in advance, you could even extend that to a month before you contact them again. But I'll, I leave it up to you, but anything more than every, seven to ten days could be perceived as annoying. And they're so, so busy. The showing empathy for how busy they are really goes a long way. Sometimes I'll even open my email with, I know how busy you are. I'll make this quick. You know, can we get the two o'clock to three o'clock instead or something like that. I'll just be super short and sweet, acknowledge that they're busy, and um, and that usually helps them move my email along. Now, if you do get denied that face-to-face, -face, you want to, again, ask uh, for a staff level meeting. If you're somehow stuck and you're being persistent but you just don't know what's going on, ask for advice. Uh, if you're not getting any replies, call the office. Uh, Ask the staffer who answers, saying, I'm just having a little trouble getting through to so-and-so. Um, can you give me some advice? And they'll say, oh, yeah, she's on maternity leave. You've got to try this person. So asking for advice is always a great way to go with these offices. Now, here's the day where you get the appointment. You wake up in the morning, and there's the email in your email box. And it's from your representative's office, and it's a face-to-face. -face, and it says, we have a time for you at 2 o'clock on you know, Wednesday, February 11th. So I always, always, always respond with an RSVP. You don't want to assume that because they're offering it, that you're accepting it. So I restate. The day and the the day of the week and the date of the week. As, I don't know if you caught that, but I just said Wednesday, February 11th. Well, I have found often that staffers, as well as you and I, can get the day and the date mixed up. Well, if they think Wednesday is the 11th and you show up on a Wednesday and the 11th is actually a Thursday, which today is, then you could show up at the office and not have an appointment. 
it's just an easy dyslexic kind of mistake to make. So I I like to prevent that by restating the details and confirming that the day and the date match up, and then send it back with any just reiterating pertinent details and thanking them for the meeting. Um, again, if this is for a DC meeting, we'd like you to enter that meeting time and date in the meeting log using your link, but you don't need to if you're doing the in-district. Then, then you've got your planning to do with your fellow group members. Um, but always check for, recheck for accuracy. I've found it's really, really easy to get a day or a time mix up or an AM and a PM, you know, mixed up. Uh, so just, just double check just so you all arrive at the right time and the right place. Now, they may respond after you RSVP saying yes and request a list of attendees. I would suggest that you could prepare a tentative list. Uh, and now, if this is in district, you probably know who all can come, and then you can send that list in. Why is it that they ask? The reason they're asking is they want to confirm that at least one constituent will be there. So that's why I suggest you include the names of the people and their hometowns. You could also include relevant details, like if someone has some expertise, uh, is, you know, is a professor at this or has some expertise in another area, you could add that if it's pertinent. They also want to have that list possibly to confirm they have enough chairs for you. We know in Washington, sometimes the meetings are held in the hallway, but in the local offices, you know, they, they have maybe a, a conference room that will only hold so many people, and they just want to make sure they have enough chairs. Uh, so a tentative list. Um, is fine if you don't um, if you don't know who's going to be there. You can at least list maybe a couple of constituents that you know are going to be there, and say you're not sure about the rest. Now for the DC, I'm jumping ahead here. For the DC lobby days, I want to give you all a heads up not to offer to send a final attendee list. Um, the reason for that is uh, we don't have the list until we actually run, the, run this software with this algorithm um, probably four or five days, six days in advance of going to DC. So you could send them a tentative list based on who you know from your hometown who is going and making the trip to DC, but I would not offer a final list beforehand. And that's because we really don't have a means to send it to the DC office from headquarters. Now there is an option. We, with our new software, we're able to send the appointment setter and all of the meeting attendees this, mas this their master schedule in advance. So they they will get their personal schedules just a few days in advance. So you could offer to the scheduler of the MOC, which is Member of Congress, you could say, "Hey, I'm going to get this schedule probably Friday before we come to DC." And I can email it to you then. But keep in mind, are you going to have access to a computer if you happen to be traveling to DC? So you maybe don't want to make that promise unless you are pretty sure you're going to be able to forward that, you know, send that email along that has who's attending and their hometown. Also, I like to suggest that for DC in particular, when we don't always have a constituent that can attend every meeting, you want to be very clear uh, about whether or not a constituent is able to attend in DC. Um, we, we lose favor with the office if they're making the assumption a constituent will be there and then no constituent shows up. So you want to be clear about that. It may mean that your meeting becomes a staff level meeting um, because of that. But in a way, that's better to keep a strong, open relationship with the office uh, rather than have it be a surprise to them that there's no constituent available. Now, I'm hoping you don't have that problem with your district meetings that you have constituents available for all of them. But always being um, very upfront about that, whether a constituent can attend or not, is important. Something you can do, it's optional, but it's a nice idea, is a few weeks before the meeting, especially if you've got the meeting set well in advance, you might shoot them a little email reminder saying, we're looking forward to meeting with you on this day at this time. Um, I actually suggest you do not request that they reply just because of how busy they are. If they see that the Congress member schedulers have cha schedule has changed or something like that, 
they'll reply back and say, whoops, we've got to change that meeting. But they usually don't have a really time to reply to all those meetings. So a gentle little reminder is short and sweet would be a great idea. I think we're almost done here, Ricky. So yes, how about questions? <laughs> Great. All right, Amy, I'll give you another moment to, to catch your breath. Um, there's a, a couple of questions in the chat box that I went ahead and responded to, but I think that um, uh, a couple of them just deserve a little clarification for everybody that may be listening on the phone as well. Um, Emily had asked, you know, is there a link somewhere to the UMBL study? And I just wanted to clarify that, you know, that's it's not available yet, so the district-level data is not available yet. That's going to be the focus, uh, Amy had talked about it earlier. It's the focus of the uh, February 25th training, so two weeks from tonight. Um, that's when that information will be coming out. So please make plans to attend that. It will also be recorded, podcasted, you know, everything. All that information will be made available for everybody. Um, uh, and, you know, Gwen had asked this, and Amy, I replied to the chat, but maybe you want to um, reply as well. But um, you should mention, you know, that um, her member of Congress is pretty skeptical uh, of, you know, the entire climate situation. So should she go ahead and pitch the UML study, or should she go with uh, another ask, like, you know, sponsoring the Gibson Resolution or something like that? Okay, so let me just repeat that. That was a... Um, uh, a, a fairly conservative person that she's not expecting to kind of jump on board with climate change. Was that right? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So I think um, probably, um, I mean, you want to talk to your group. We trust you guys to, to make these decisions in a group setting. There may be another group member who has a little insight as to what that your secondary ask might be for the person. But, but for someone who may be skeptical of the science and not really on board with that part of, of, of what we're trying to do, may be very responsive to the dividend, the money that's coming back, the Kevin um, Ummel, it's a U-M-M-E-L, I believe is the spelling, that may have really valuable information about how well economically the members of his district or her district will do. So that might be really encouraging. Now you may look at that, that data once you get it and just change your mind, you know, depending on how that data looks for that district. So I actually would kind of throw it back to your group to have a discussion about knowing your member, even though he's conservative. I I'm going to guess he's probably not going to necessarily sign on to the Gibson resolution if he's skeptical of the science. So thinking of putting some other things out there about how his district will improve economically might might be the way to go. Ricky, do you have Great. a response to that? Well, yeah, the, uh, my response in the chat now it was very similar. It was just, you know, that I think the most in the, the I guess the most important thing a member of Congress wants to know, or even a, an aide, anybody that's working in that office, is how our policy will impact their district. And we're actually going to have that level of data to be able to, to show them that now, which is, uh, you know, going to be a really powerful tool for us. So um, I, I think that's the reason for the meeting. And then, like Amy said, yeah, you, you definitely uh, – Want to go to the groups, look at past meeting minutes, if there are any really to, or, you know, just do your research on that member of Congress. Okay, what's the, what's the secondary ask? What's something I can do that can just sort of move the ball forward? Um, and so there are a lot of different examples, and we'll talk about those um, on the February 25th training as well. And then uh, there's a question in the chat window, Amy, uh, if you want to respond to this from Peter. He asks, what is the time window for the in-district meetings? Okay, the time window, and you want to check with your district offices. It's March 24th through April 11th, but that's going to vary depending on what your member is doing. Does is he staying in D.C. A, a few extra days? As I mentioned, we had a few members who have already told um, appointment setters that they're not going to be there certain days. So that's why that initial research is important to, to confirm that your member is going to be there. We're looking at March 24th through April 11th. But if you need that to be slightly different, you know, that's fine. If that's what it takes to be the weekend before or the weekend after the Congress member says he'll take meetings on a Saturday, go for it. Uh, whatever whatever works for your group, but that's the general time frame where we think they will be out of D.C. and in the district. It's slightly different for the Senate to the House, so just ask them and reconfirm with the office uh, what the available dates would be. 
great. And you know, hey, I just want to follow up on one on another point about Gwen's question because I, I think this is it gets to the heart of a lot. Of, well, we're kind of getting into lobbying right now. Maybe I don't want to. We're talking about scheduling, but um, the other thing I would just add on to that, Gwen, is. Um, you know, when you present something like the UML data to someone who's, you know, skeptical of the science, then, you know, ask them questions about the UML data. You know, really focus in on that and try to draw out more information from them on that versus something that you know you disagree with them on. And uh, that might be another way forward to find some common ground. Um, sorry, I don't mean to get into lobbying. That's going to be the focus of everything else later. Um, so we still have time for questions. We've got about 14 minutes. Um, Amy's going to make stuff available to the top of the hour. So if you guys want to ask a question, you can press star one to Unmute yourself or click the little microphone symbol next to your name if you're online. Hey, hi, this is Dave again. Um, do, do, you have, do we have the text of the UML study available? I'm sorry if it's already been revealed, but I wasn't sure. No, that's not available yet. Danny is working on preparing that for us. So that's my understanding, Ricky. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. That's going to be the February 25th training, correct. So it is okay. going to be hot off the presses. Yeah, Thank it you. will be. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Well, one more question. Um, we have in, here in my district, we have um, a lame duck congressman. Um, he's going to be retiring at the end of this period. I guess it'll be... November when he's replaced. Mm -hmm. Is there any point? Is there any point in trying to meet with him? Absolutely. You still want to meet with him. Um, he can be a great source. Uh, you can ask so many questions. Um, sometimes when someone is a, a lame duck, as you mentioned, they may be, you know, more willing to do something in their final months in office. Um, that said, I have I have had, you know, where that's not the case. But um, if you went and found out from this member who else they work with across the aisle, who do they work with on the same side of the aisle, what are their concerns about this topic. Um, you can still peel back the layers and learn more from this member because of his experience and, if, and, and showing him or her appreciation for his time in office, you know, there could be valuable information that comes out of that. So I absolutely encourage you to still meet. And I would add advice. that, you know, I would just add that those staffers in that office, they're going to be going somewhere too. And a lot of times they're going to other offices and or maybe even the new office uh, the, of the new office holder. And so um, it, even if you're just going in to develop a relationship with them, it can pay off. I know that's happened with us a couple of times where staffers moved to a new office. And it was in a district where we didn't have a liaison. It was like perfect. We already had a relationship with the staffer, so. Yes, that has happened many, many times. In fact, we had a staffer of a representative in California, this was quite a few years back, that moved and, and worked with a staffer in on the East Coast, and he got the, his new rep to sign on to um, a previous policy that we were supporting, I believe it was Pete Stark's um, policy in California, so several years back, and it was because of the relationship with the staffer. Another question? Well, it sounds like you did a fantastic job, Amy. So we're going to well, end a little yeah. early tonight. Yeah. Um, what I want to emphasize here is these are just, yeah, you know, it's, it's so cute. I love it that Ricky introduced me as knowing so much about this, but really it's because I ask a lot of questions and I don't know it all. Every office is different and your relate. we really, you know, have so much faith in you all to, you know, get to know you, the folks in the local office and the D.C. office and use your best judgment and ask for their advice and, and just build that relationship. And so go ye forward and create great appointments. All right. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all that with us tonight. Um, once again, uh, we will have the – we're taking a week off next week um, for Citizen Climate Lobby University, but on the 25th we'll be returning with uh, Danny's analysis of the UML data and how we are able going to be able to um, use that in our meetings. He'll also cover 
um, you know, all the other bills that have been submitted. So we'll be able to uh, go over that information and really just an update on our legislative strategy overall. So that's going to be a really, really important training. We want to make sure, and if you're a group leader, make sure all your uh, folks, uh, you know, dial in or call in or are part of that one. Um, let's get the word out and, uh, you know, let's all have a, a great training in a couple of weeks. All right, that's all for tonight. I appreciate everyone being here, and uh, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Hey, thank Thanks, you. Amy. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy.